This is Sue Silvius, which is Tina Jane's mother. They found out today that her cancer spread from the lungs through the lymph nodes and to the brain. And so there's no idea what treatment's going to be, but it doesn't look good, neither hers. Okay? So, I don't know that I know her. Maybe I've met her before. Is she ever from church here? She, she, was, she was here when they had Lane's adoption. Oh, okay. I, I was here during that, but I don't remember meeting her. No, that's too bad. Uh, yeah, and then up today. Um, anything else? And that's the new one today. We need to keep keep a praised of uh, praised of. Uh, Rex Tinsley, he's going to be having carotid artery surgery on the 29th. So. Still that same just took it out. I guess. I hope that. I I, that is it's scary, isn't it? I guess. I just think it's scary. I just remember one night. One of the guys in the church I was in Kansas that had that done. So. It wasn't it, uh, what was that guy's name? And they <coughs> flipped the coin to do the heart or the carotid artery, and they decided to do the carotid artery first, and they had a heart attack on the table. You know what I'm talking about? Lived down there in the uh, trailer courts there by the, where, uh, Mildred Myers used to live, lived in that trailer court. What was her name? They were from Kansas. They were from, uh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah they were from Kansas, up north. Um, they were up at, um, they were from Mountain City, Kansas. So I know the name where they were from because I was preached up that area. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Oh, yeah. Uh, goodness sakes alive, what was her name? Did both their funerals anyway? He was blind. Dorothy Walmer. Wally Walmer. As soon as you said Dorothy, I got it. But anyway, Wally got was blind there for a little bit. Remember that? They finally got some signs out. Wow. So that's why I say we need to keep Rex in our prayers. You know, I don't want that to happen to him, and I'm glad he's not here, so I don't hear what I have to say about it. Okay. Anything else? Well, let's pray. If that fan's a little bit too loud, we can turn it off now because I'm good. I'm, I'm cool enough. You're cool enough, aren't you? I, I'm worried more about her than I do me because I, you know, I know she doesn't like this hot. So, <laughs> Father, we thank you so much for all you do, and I praise you for the opportunity to be here. Father, I just pray that uh, you be a Tina's mom and just Father, just guide the doctors. And, and I know that Ryan's having a hard time with it too. But, Father, just bless that family and we give you praise for what you're going to do in that. Youth Rex, and just pray that uh, the doctors know what to do with him as well. And we have those that can't trust him in Christ. Amen. There's a woman here that lived down there on the road that goes 39 over to CZ. It goes over to Honet. So they lived over there, and I took uh, a community to them. Never did find them. <laughs> Finally gave up and came home. Four cell phones. Right, right. <laughs> I did later on. Yeah, it's kind of funny now, isn't it? Um, well, I started doing the math today. I know it sounds kind of weird, but I'm doing Bible study when I start doing math. But uh, I. I was looking and I got about, uh, we're, we're starting the, uh, really going into the crucifixion <laughs> in Luke. And, you know, I, I've looked at, I got about 35 more lessons or so in, in Luke, kind of looking at that idea. And so I, I basically what I've done is I'm going to drop off Luke until September. Okay, so between now and then we're going to do hot topics, which is kind of hot topics with the, the weather we're having right now, right? Uh, I kind of do this when I, pre I used to preach hot topics, but uh, I'm going to we're going to study hot topics and and I, you know, like I said, 
I, I think that I'd rather start talking about the crucifixion and kind of work my way through this actually resurrection come about right uh, Easter next year is October, uh, April 4th, first Sunday in April. So, and we have five Sundays in March this next year. So, anyway, we'll see how it works. But I'm going to work on this for about a month. And I'm going to spend a, uh, a couple uh, nights on the topic I'm on tonight. And, and I'm not saying that I'm going to be doing preaching out of, uh, we're going to do some Roman passages. We're going to work on that Roman passage on Sunday, which has to do, you know, we, we kind of, this topic I'm talking about relates to what I preach on Sunday, is what I'm trying to tell you. And it, it is, it kind of fits this a little bit, but, you know, I talk a little bit about that, but, you know, it's, it's one of those sermons that you want to make sure you prepare for, you know, just don't throw it out there. But it has to do with civil disobedience, okay? So we'll kind of get this right as we go through this, but first thing I want to tell you is that the reality is that uh, the Bible is unmistakably clear about human nature, it, it's very clear. There's no question about it that all people are sinners. You know, I just uh, was very shocked today. You guys watch Fox News. You guys get Fox News or anything. I don't know whether it's on any of the other channels. I just listen to Fox. But none of those two, three boys that got killed uh, went fishing down in, is it Louisiana? No, no it's in Florida. It's south in Florida. They went fishing last weekend. They were all killed. Well, they caught the guy today. Caught him, and he was just an absolute guy who was absolutely evil and personified that killed him. And he had 250 felonies uh, arrest. 250. Yeah. Uh, well, he'd been, he, 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 he was only 20, he was in his 20s, mid-20s. He'd been in prison twice and he started having trouble when he was 12. And you just wonder how someone could away stuff like that. Again. And he was, that's another thing that he, well, he had a gun most in gun owners don't, uh, I said most gun owners don't legally own them. Well, anyone. Anyway. Criminal, most criminal. All criminals that own one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I legally own a gun. Well, I, I mean, do, I'm, but. You're not a criminal. No. Criminal <laughs> owners, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't totally agree with most people, most gun owners own them illegally. I would think that, but I would say that all like criminals they're not have a gun. Like they're not registered is what she meant. Like, Do what? Like they're, they're not legally owned. Well, they're I'm glad you're here to explain what your mom means. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea. Alan doesn't even attempt. That's right. Alan doesn't even do that. Alan just kind of goes, whatever she says. I don't care. But you had San Francisco. If they get convicted with their guns, you're going to take their property. You'd be a felon. They won't be able to help them get them. Yeah, right. Uh, and, and well, they'll probably lose their law license too. Law license. They're both attorneys. Yeah, not criminal attorneys, but they're both attorneys. But the the point, of, I guess, what I'm making is, is that I mean, obviously he had a gun, and obviously he was illegal, and it says that in the charges that he had the gun illegally, and he had ammunition illegally, but the guy was out of control, evil. Is what he was, and probably. But what we're going to do is we're going to find some of that, how that happens, as we talk about this tonight. But uh, you know, people are born uh, little sinners. You know, I've never ever had to tell my girls, uh, you know, uh, you make sure you act up. You know, that was never hard. It was always easy for them to do something that I had to spank them for. You know what I mean? They, they just they're that way. You know, clean your room. Okay come in there, it's all underneath the bed, you know, that kind of thing. You know, that's not cleaning the room, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, uh, the idea is that certainly, as we understand this very clearly, that um, uh, we live in a very scary world. I mean, when you think about what happened to those guys, I mean, this being, they went to Dollar General in a place where there's never any crime. You know what I mean? They went out and fished, and this thing's happened because of one guy that was there. But you know, there is a, uh, we have a lot of te technology that's out there. Um, and, you know, even though we have these technologies that are out there, uh, you know, and okay, let me think of this. Let me come back to my question. 
Well, let's say this. Uh, <laughs> you, you guys, we heard last yesterday or something. Somebody got uh, almost got trampled by a buffalo about it, Yellowstone, because they were way too close. You know what I mean? And it's kind of funny to me because they always tell you, don't get too close, because they're wild animals. You know, they can charge you. Uh, but they're not the most dangerous animal in the world. Uh, tigers are not the most dangerous animals in the world. Uh, sharks are not the most dangerous animals in the world. The most dangerous animal in the world is not an animal, that's man. We're the ones that, in, in a sense, um, can devise harm. You know, these, this guy went into the Dollar General and watched this kid and called that kid out. Ten minutes later, killed him. I mean, I mean that's heinous. But the point of it is, is that man can do that kind of thing. We've, we've invented uh, uh, lots of ways to kill people. And so I guess in the sense that that is kind of a scary thing when you consider they were thinking about defunding the police department. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, they called, uh, uh, they told the, uh, some people in New York City, now when these people are shooting fireworks, now you go out there and you tell them not to. Don't call the cops yet because that's not a very bad crime. You know, you just tell them to stop. Some lady went out and told them to stop and they killed them. You know what I mean? That's the kind of thing when you expect people to do what police should be doing. You know what I mean? Police have guns. Uh, they are a deterrent. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. But uh, if you go back to uh, Genesis, you'll find out at the very beginning, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every intent of every thought of his heart was only evil continually. And that's a scary thing when you think about that. You know, that puts you back to where man is and the base, base is he's there. Uh, very, very corrupt. So, uh, um, you know, from creation, Adam and Eve, chapters 1 and 2, you have the garden. Chapter 3, man falls. Chapter 6, what happens? You have a flood. Yeah. Um, you know, a couple hundred years, you know. After that, God has to destroy the whole world. So that just tells you the corruption of man. The Bible is very clear about that. Okay, uh, Jeremiah describes it this way: the heart is more deceitful than all else, and is desperately wicked. The heart is deceitful, desperately wicked, uh, and uh, you know it is. Uh, the Lord kind of knows this. He searches the heart, and God is saying it is wicked, and I know it. I see it, uh, and uh, you know. We got these people thinking that people are basically good. Uh, not really. People aren't basically good. And and that's kind of what we, we see that. We've got to have some kind of deterrence that's out there, okay? Uh, but it is, uh, this is what uh, you see, that that which proceeds out of man, that defiles a man and from within, from the heart of man, proceeds evil thoughts, acts of sexual immorality, thefts, wickedness, murders, adulteries, Deeds of covetousness and wickedness, as well as deceit, debauchery, evil, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evils proceed from within and defile the man. So the problem is not outside of us, it's inside of us. Not outside, it's inside. Okay? Uh, so we'll look at Romans 3. And let's start at verse 10. Someone read that. You what? You can't read it? Okay. Go ahead, Pam. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become useless. There is none who does good, there is not even one. Their throat is an open grave, with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Okay, so what you've got in Portland, Oregon is that. You understand what I'm saying? This is base man. They're quick to do what all these things it says here. Okay? Uh, there is no one righteous, no one who genuinely does good uh, and that you know, does good to please God. Uh, they're dangerous. They're like poisonous snakes. You know, I, I would be scared of that. And Portland, the reason why it's like that, because all the restraints just left. I, I, I heard a thing today, at 9 o'clock, police leave, and they come in. Uh, huge crowds in Portland. 
and this guy was in, he was watching it, but they just, the police leave. You know, I, I don't know why they leave, I guess it's because they told them to leave. Yeah, and so they stand down and they tear up things, uh, which is ridiculous to me. Now, the, I guess it would be the city, the mayor does, the, the liberal mayors, okay? Um, you know that... It's, it's been 55 days that Portland has put up with this. The mayor said they didn't want Trump intervening and sending troops. Well, and, and back, in the old, back in the old days, you would want somebody to come help you in a situation like that. You know what I mean? You'd want the government to come and help you. But now they don't care. They don't want the government in there because I don't know. You know, and I'm not going to go into what I think is going on because I think it's a really, it's an agenda more than just a thing. It's more, it's an agenda, and it has to do with socialism, uh, how they disrupt things and cause things happen. A really, really great black preacher uh, in Africa talks about a kind of black guy, and he's talking about social justice here. Uh, he was raised up in South L.A., which you can imagine for that guy, you know. But anyway, he's got some really neat things to say about it. But man, you got to really hang in there with him. It's kind of like listening to me. <laughs> you, can't, you get lost. I don't know. Well, maybe it's maybe. It's just like, oh, oh. I was listening hard trying to get But he is really smart. Really good guy. But anyway, God has put in human life some restraints. Okay, we're going to talk about those restraints a little bit. Okay? Uh, these restraints mitigate evil. God in society has put restraints, has to mitigate evil, all right? And it's to mitigate corruption. The corruption that we're seeing out in Portland, there is that that's there. Uh, and it is a, he did this so that can, there could be a civilized society. I mean, you think about it. When Christ came, was during the Roman time, what were some good things about the Romans that made it easy for the gospel to go out? Roman. That's right. Romans had control. Okay, that's probably the biggest one. You know, they, they had Roman roads. They had uh, society, civil society. Paul got to go to Rome because he was a Roman citizen. He was going to be killed, but the Romans wouldn't let him kill him. You know, what I mean, they, they they took him away uh, because of that. He was in Jerusalem, right? And they were getting ready to kill him, and they he, uh, they took him out of Jerusalem uh, just that quick. Okay. Uh, and that's the idea. There was the reason why the gospel was out here in the Roman times because of peace that was out there. Okay, um, God does this. I mean, it's great. I'll just tell you, I kind of miss peaceful times. I'm not that we've had terribly peaceful times all the time, but um, you know, it is amazing because you know, what, six months ago we were. It was kind of peaceful. <laughs> You know what I mean? It wasn't super peaceful, but at least we had uh, a little bit of peace. And now it's just, it's, I don't know, it's almost like we, every day we hear something else. Uh, you know, another riot, another killing. Uh, last night in Chicago at a funeral service, they had a big gun battle. Can you imagine that? You know, I think people at funerals during that. I know, I know. I was like, you know, we might as well, you're having a funeral, might as well have a couple more while you're there. It just makes a lot easier. Well, and I was reading today that uh, the mayor of Chicago blames Trump for all their gun problems because he doesn't have strong federal laws to keep them from buying all these arms, you know, and stuff. And, and like, Chicago's already got the strictest law of the land for guns. Yeah, no, I... Nancy Bloss is called the coronavirus, now coronavirus. That's something. Uh, I know. It's just, yeah, but I, she was saying that all these people are just crossing over into Indiana, which is one of the most lax states there is, and buying all these guns and bringing back in the first state. So, uh, I, you know, politics is politics and everybody in. It is. And I mean, it's, it's, election. it's election year, and they're going to be everything you hear. And you know what? You've got to mitigate that with just a little bit of the fact that it's politics. I mean, I, there's politics in Lawrence County right now that makes me sick. You know what I mean? And I've just had it. But it, it is. It's unreal. Isn't it? But anyway, having said that, God put these restraints there so we can have a little peace in the world. That we can enjoy the graces that He's been giving us. It's a beautiful world we live in. You know, isn't it great if you can just go on vacation and not have to worry about someone shooting you? You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Uh, great to go to Dollar General and leave and go fishing all night. Um, 
without having to worry about somebody pulling you away. I mean, that's the that's the idea that we're talking about. And uh, you know, whenever I I think about this, is when we sit back, thank God for all the blessings we have. You know, we still do. And I mean, don't you? We just thank God for all the things He's done for us. We've got a great country, a powerful country, and I think it's great that we have these things from God. And this is because God has set this up, mitigating things that mitigate this evil. Number one is this, the conscience. Okay? Now let's talk about that a little bit. This is the per this is a personal court. Okay? In that way. It's a personal restraint. Alright, now let's think about this. Romans chapter 2, verse 11. Uh, we, we start out, uh, we already looked at chapter 3, which is really talking about some really rough things about man. And then we go into... Uh, uh, verse 11 in chapter 9, not chapter uh, 3, I'm, 2, I mean, sorry. I'm looking at two things. All right, now let's look at that. It says this, for God does not show favoritism or partiality, all right? And the subject here is judgment, all right? He's talking about judgment. He's saying, I don't show partiality. By the way, when I say social justice, you don't need anything to... to uh, Justice is justice. You don't need a social link with it. You know, justice is just justice. But that's God here. He does not show uh, impartiality. God judges impartially. All right? Uh, and you think, well, wait a minute. Uh, uh, is, uh, you know, and, and here's the thing. You've got the Jews over here that are judged by the law because God gave them the law. And we have, we, and that's what he's saying. Now, you have people over here that don't have the law. What judges them? And that's the question that this is going to answer for us. What judges those? Because all humans are sinful, but what if they don't have the law? Okay. I was listening to a, a uh, atheist the other day, and we were, it was a debate between an atheist and a Christian. And, you know, one of the things that the Christian brought up was this, the conscience, you know, and how it's something that happens in there. And the guy was just like, well, no. I, and, of course, he couldn't, he couldn't define why he thought the way he thought, you know. Uh, but it was conscience. But anyway, this is what it says. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. Okay, you get two pictures now. People who have a law, which would be the Jewish people, right? And those who don't have it, which would be what? The Greeks, right? For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it's those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles, what? Would it be Gentiles here? Would it be non-believers? We're talking about non-believers when we say Gentiles. Non-Jews. That's right, non-Jews. Who do not have, not to be fair, it makes sense, but I'm just wondering if it's like because they're not believers yet, too. Because well, once well, they you, get... Well, you compare that to you compare to Jews to Christians. Okay, right, right. Who do not have the law by, do by nature, what? Things of the law, required by the law, they are what? A law for themselves, even though they don't have a law. What's that talk about? It's about conscience, isn't it? God has put in man the first restraint, okay? In other words, I didn't, it's really kind of weird, but I didn't have to teach my girls that it was wrong to lie. They kind of lied and I, they knew it. They already knew they'd done something wrong. You understand that? Um, and that's something that they, they got, okay? And I see that about sin in general. People kind of know, you know, a thief, uh, you know, he may not have been there, but he, he still, he, he knows that that's, he has a conscience, he's, he knows he's doing something wrong, it is the point. But uh, uh, the point of it is, uh, and then it goes, uh, and then it says, uh, 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 since they show the requirements of the law written on their hearts, their conscience are also bearing witness and their thoughts now accusing them, now uh, now even defending them. This will take place in the day of God's judgment. So uh, everybody has a uh, kind of a sixth sense. We have all the senses, taste, sight, feel, you know what I mean? We have those senses, but this is like a sixth sense in us. We have a law of God written on our heart, okay? It is... Uh, uh, Remember Adam and Eve, uh, what God said. Don't eat of that tree. And they did. And what they do after they ate it? They learned good and evil. They immediately 
they, they learn right from wrong, okay? And in a sense, we all kind of have that in our sense. We know right from wrong. I, I, I just know. You know, I know there's things I got in trouble for, but most of the time when I got in trouble for when I was a kid, I knew I'd already done something wrong. How about you? Mm -hmm. I mean, you kind of knew that already. And <laughs> so many things, you know, that we did, that we tried to hide in that way. But they have God's law written uh, on their hearts, okay? So, it says in that, Romans 1 says that men are without excuse. Men have no excuse in that way. Um, and, you know, this is kind of interesting because uh, uh, I don't know the whole law. I, you know, uh, law is a big deal. In it. There's a lot of little things like that. I don't know the law. But I kind of know when I'm uh, breaking it. You know what I mean? Uh, we, we uh, Halloween was kind of really bad time to die, I'm just saying. Uh, we pushed a guy's car over a little embankment. No big deal. I mean, it wasn't a big deal. Um, he was in a, over an embankment into a foundation, <laughs> so he couldn't get out. And, and but we got in trouble for that. We knew it was wrong. You know, policemen come over there, and we're like, you guys, you know. And uh, thankfully, let's go, because my mom was out. I'd been killed in high school. Uh, I told her later, but I confessed. Uh, <laughs> but you understand, we know things are right and wrong. And, and it's that way. We have no excuse in that way. And uh, uh, it is instinctive is what I'm trying to tell you. All right? It's instinctive. And and this comes out to that the conscience bearing witness. It bears witness to them. It's that sixth sense saying there's something there. Okay? So uh, this is a knowledge of right and wrong. It's part of being a human being, all right? We're going to talk a little bit about how that gets seared here in a minute. But we know that. We know what's wrong. Uh, that's given by God. So you have a mechanism, and that mechanism is called your conscience, all right? This is good to know because uh, conscience is, uh, you know, we see people and we say, ooh, they have a guilty conscience. You ever heard, you know, you're someone you'll talk, they'll be talking and you tell they got a guilty conscience. Okay. What do some people do when they have a guilty conscience? Well, a lot of some people drink. You know, uh, they do drugs. Why? Because that appeases that conscience. You know, guilty conscience. And and so that that is what we see. But there, uh, it's interesting. Uh, back in the days with the Indian tribes, if someone was uh, lying, what they would do is they would put fire on their tongue. They thought they were lying. And I guess. When they lie, your tongue gets dry. You know what I mean? And it burned your tongue. But if you didn't lie, you'd have slide on your tongue, it wouldn't burn you. That was how we tested something. Uh, don't like that test. I don't think it'd be a good one. Uh, we used the old uh, soap test where it worked bad enough. But uh, can you imagine that? But that was the idea. It was your mouth would be dry when you tell a lie. A lot of people did that. And that's kind of the idea. But there is a mechanism that uh, creates Fear, guilt, anxiety, dread, panic. Are you with me? That's part of that mechanism that's there. Okay. What is the Greek word for conscious? Anyone know what it, what it is? I mean, you know how Greek is. Greek talks about, gives definitions that we know. Uh, anyone know what it is? Self-knowledge. Conscience. Self-knowledge is the word. So you understand that? It's knowing, you already knew this. You never have to teach a kid uh, some of those things they already know. You know what I mean? Um, I had some kids steal lunch tickets when I was in school. I, they knew it was wrong. We didn't have a rule, you can't steal lunch tickets because we don't have to make that rule. How do we even have to make that rule? You know what I mean? It's, a, it's innate. They knew it was wrong to steal. You know, they knew they were doing something wrong. And the reason why they found out, guess what? Some kid had a guilty conscience and he confessed. You know, and that's how it works in that way. But when people do evil, their conscience goes into action and it's a warning device. It's a warning device. Um, how many of you like pain? Okay, good. No one raised their hand. I just raised my hand as an example. I don't like pain. Okay, conscience is painful. It can be painful. 
you know, um, I uh, I remember one time that uh, uh, I I did something wrong in school, and mom for a whole week wouldn't tell my dad what I did. I was supposed to tell him what I did, and I didn't sleep that week. It was painful. You know what I mean? Very very painful because I knew that what I was going to tell my dad wasn't going to make him happy. You know what I mean? And that was back when I was in sixth grade. I'll never forget it. I can tell you the week it was. Uh, but anyway, six, uh, sixth grade, and I was just, I was miserable for a whole week. Uh, you know, I, I didn't even eat supper at night because every time I'd set a supper table, mom goes, you don't tell your dad tonight? I'd just get up and leave. You know, I'm like, no, I'm not uh, I finally did have to kill him. But the point of it is that's painful when you do that. It's painful. And, um, and why is it, by the way, Pain, by the way, is a good thing. Um, when I had pain in my uh, knee, I realized that it was wore out. I got to do, it. you know what I mean? That pain's a good thing. You have a pain in your side, and or in your uh, midsection, and all of a sudden you get really, really painful. If you didn't have that pain, you wouldn't know you had appendicitis. You understand that pain's a good thing. Pain is a, a blessing from God. Well, this is this pain of a conscience is a blessing from God. Why? Because it. It's pain in the moral area. It's pain in the moral area. It stops you from doing the wrong thing. It stops you from going down the wrong path. Okay. It stops you, and uh, when you need help, okay. It says this: Don't continue in this behavior. That's why conscience is good. So it's a gift from God. It's a restraint. All right. And it is a restraint. The first restraint that God puts in a person to hold them back um, from doing evil things. The first restraint in society, okay, so we, we got that one, okay. Now the basic restraint that God has provided uh, is that every single human being in the world has that built-in restraint, okay. But, uh, uh, you know, you, you say, well, some people uh, don't have a conscience. Uh, well, is a... Uh, uh, when you start thinking about, does this guy have a conscience? Well, uh, it's a gift from God, written on hearts. But this mechanism uh, accuses us in that sense. But the problem is, uh, there's a, you can tamper with it. All right, here we go. You can tamper with it, sir. Yeah, you can sear it. All right. Two ways. Number one, you can tamper the law of God about right and wrong by twisting and perverting the law. We see this today. What does it say? Well, uh, we take sweet and make it uh, change sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. Uh, we say right for wrong, right? We say right is wrong and wrong is right. You see what I'm saying? We reverse the morality. In other words, when you get to a certain point, uh, people say to you, ah, well, that's not, that's just an old uh, Judeo Christian rule, you don't have to do that. They they say to you, well you're just an ape. You're you're an animal. Right? I mean you're you are you have evolution, you you uh, you evolved from the ape. Uh, so bottom line if you can live like an animal it doesn't matter. So you, you see what I'm saying? You someone tells you that that nah, doesn't matter if you do that. Okay? Um, and so it is a uh, 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 you confuse people on that training of the conscience. You know, there's a certain point where it begins a training process. There is a, uh, you know, it, it goes on in our culture today like crazy. The things that, and I'm sure that you guys can back me on this, things that were wrong 30, 40 years ago that were just taboo in our society are not anymore. You understand what I'm saying? We're just not. You know, uh, uh, I remember uh, back when I was in, uh, uh, back when I was a kid, they had Sunday blue, law, blue laws. Uh, why was there? Why were there blue laws? Anyone know? It was like alcohol. Go buy an alcohol on Sunday. Uh, there were blue laws. Um, it was moral, moral stuff, right? Um, you know, there was um, uh, no. I mean, pinballs, the pinball machines. They. They were going to yank them out of these 
dairy bars and wherever they got them because people were, they could win a game. You know how you used to win a game yeah. when you played? Yeah, it was gambling. If you played that pinball and you won a game, that's gambling. And they were going to take that out. It's changed, has it? Now you can go about any place and gamble wherever you want to. But that's my point, is that society and the culture has changed some of that. And it's made it where, you know, some people, that's not wrong. One, it's not wrong, you know. My parents did that. Um, and that's part of the way it goes. Media changes this, doesn't it? Media has been telling us forever. Uh, it's okay to write uh, because you got to be heard. Really? <laughs> you know, but that's the point. We get that. Uh, so it, it is a, uh, a lot of young people that are coming up that are just, and, and we've already seen that. It's kind of twisted morality. It is unbelievable. You know, I, uh, you know, uh, a lot of things that, that I can say about this. <clears throat> but uh, when your belief system is perverted, the conscience is confused. You understand that? And that's where we start messing with it, okay? Another thing you can do is that you can make your conscience illegitimate. In other words, uh, you shouldn't feel guilty about that. You know, that's illegitimate. That's not right. You shouldn't feel bad about that. Uh, it's all about you, right, in, in that way. Uh, uh, you should be proud that you're like this kind of thing. Uh, this is you. Uh, you know, it don't matter if you do something like that because you're raised that way. You're born that way. Nobody can tell you what to do. You shouldn't feel guilty. I'm not going to have that church people tell me how to live my life. You know, and that's, that's kind of what happens. Okay, it's illegitimate. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of people who say that feeling guilty is wrong um, in, in that way. There's books and psychologists say that guilt is bad. Uh, certain sins are good, now good in, in that way. And if you speak against those sin, guess what? If I speak against that sin, I'm bad. If I tell somebody that they need to mitigate their behavior, then I'm bad. You know, that's the difference now. So you kind of change it, reverses it that way. And so it confuses the conscience in that way so that uh, uh, all this is going on into man's life. And we, I, I think it's like anything. You know, you it's the frog in the kettle idea. You know what I mean? Put a frog in the cold kettle and turn the heat up, he'll sit there and boil. Well, we've done that in our country. We've let these people get away with stuff, and it's not wrong. You need to express yourself. You know, people need to riot after things like this happen. No, but that's what we've told them. Okay? So these are kind of things that we've got, but there is a uh, 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 kind of way that happens. So the first thing in us is just that straight out conscience. Everybody has it. All right? Now, there's some people who don't have conscience on it. They're just totally gone. Uh, one thing that one of the best ways to get rid of your conscience is keep doing something in it over and over again until it's seared or it doesn't bother you anymore. And if you're in this sinful state and you can do something without it bothering you, you ought to be worried because it's restraint number one. Okay? The second restraint is God created the family. Okay? The family. This is interesting because uh, a lot of people that we're talking about in really these situations are single parent homes. You know, uh, I was uh, listening to some of the things and it was amazing the amount of single parent homes that are out there, okay? Uh, but uh, conscience is a personal restraint. Family is a relational restraint, all right? Now, um, it's interesting to me that the first thing was done in our society and college. The second thing is being done literally. You know, families are falling apart. Where we have now, we used to call uh, marriage was between a man and a woman. They had kids, that kind of thing. That was society. Now it's anything goes, right? We don't have that anymore. We don't, family's not a big thing. In fact, if you have family in this country, isn't it right that, I mean, even taxes don't cover you as well if you're like a single parent. You know, you can get more money tax wise, right? Uh, if you're a single parent and have kids, and you can if you're, uh, you know, people, I remember whenever uh, uh, they would have, uh, 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 call them uh, dinks, remember that? Double income, no kids, remember that? Uh, two people, though, working together, husband and wife. Uh, 
you know, I was in college, Sharon and I were sinks when she was in college. I was single income, no, no kids. <laughs> so we were definitely sinks. Uh, but, you know, the, the point of it is that, that that is the restraint that God has put there, and we kind of destroyed the family. We continue to do that in that way. But anyway, family is a building block for civilization. Uh, now, it's the family is supposed to be, you know, supposed to be the place for love, place for uh, truthfulness, place where you can, uh, uh, as a parent, restrain evil from your kids, okay? Uh, you know, it's interesting, an animal, like, you go out to uh, Africa and you watch a gazelle be born. Uh, they're up and running, just like that. A calf, right? You get a calf's born and it's within, what, half a day they're up and running? Up, up maybe? Really? So that you get, so you get the idea. But uh, I don't know, but I've been watching that little Nora. She's still people dragging her around. She'll never learn to walk. People carry her everywhere she goes. Uh, and I don't blame her either. She's sweet as she can be. But you know, that's what kids are. You you they're not up and going with that. We are to we develop that closeness to them. You know. We may complain about clean diapers, but I guarantee it causes relation that you uh, you do something to help people like that, you uh, you get close to tax. You know, I, I am amazed at how close you can get to your kids. You know, glad glad that the Lord gave me a couple because I didn't realize just how close you can get to your own kids. You understand me, don't you? Uh, it's just the way it is. But it is a very, very strong relationship, strong bonds that we make in our families, okay? Can you imagine um, being in a home without that? You know, where you don't have that strong family. You know, you, you have your friends. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, God has, God made this to happen that way, okay? And, and I'll just tell you, whenever you know, I'll just tell you, um, uh, two little sinners were born into my family. You know, my two little girls are sinners, and they needed somebody to teach them right and wrong. And I was to restrain that. You know, if I would have let my daughter get away with everything, both of them, I would have had a lot more trouble in the end. You know, I'm not saying that's a perfect way to go, but it's just that we're the mitigators of that, okay? Um, anyway, um, we're barriers. That have been set up for them to teach them right and wrong. Okay, that will becomes a divinely given institution uh, of uh, restraint for sin. You know, what? How do we do that? Anyone know? Remember some of the things said you. Uh, uh, it is a. Uh, for instance. Uh, uh, in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy said this. Uh, now this is commandments, the statutes of judgment. This is commandment. Uh, statute of judgments, the Lord your God has commanded you to teach you that you may do them in the land where you're going to possess it. And then he says, you are to, uh, here's what the Lord commands you. You, your sons, your grandsons, what? Fear the Lord and keep all the statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, uh, hear, Israel, the Lord, your, Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and with all your might. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Okay? What do you do with them? They're in your heart. You shall teach them diligently <coughs> to your sons. Okay? And you shall talk to them when you sit at your house. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, that tells me that I'm there all the time. Um, and that's Deuteronomy chapter 6. Goal is that you teach your kids these things. You teach what God says to them. Okay? And you bind them and sign your hand, and they shall be uh, on your foreheads. Okay? Uh, write them on the doorpost of your house. That's the idea that we're doing. Okay? And so it is a... Uh, Something that we do as a family, we, we teach our kids. We, we strive. We are that. We're mitigating evil. If you don't do that as a parent, 
Your kid goes out there without any authority. They don't understand authority. Next thing you know, they become a problem in society. But if you teach your kid, they become a good citizen. And that's the idea. They become good uh, doing right, knowing right from wrong, uh, not perfect or anything, but trying to do the best they can. And then it is a, uh, um, you know, th this is how it is. It works out together. Now, um, this is in um, chapter 2 of Proverbs. Um, my son, uh, hear the instructions of your father. Uh, hear the instructions of your mother. Chapter after chapter after chapter, it talks about all kinds of things. You teach your kids in that way. And then he says that he who spares the rod does what? Hates the child. Hates the child. Hates the child. Hates the child. That's just something that people need to hear, don't they? If you spare the rod, you hate your child. Why? Because it drives out that little sin. A little bit of sin out of it. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, I just remember that, you know, after a couple whippings, you start doing the right thing. You know? Uh, in that way. Uh, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Uh, the rod of discipline removes it far from him. Uh, Proverbs 22, 15. 23, 13. Do not hold back the discipline from your child. Although you strike him with the rod, what? He won't die. He will not die. That's what it says. I guess you don't hit him in the head. Uh, it's interesting. God gave a big old muscle back there to hit. You know, uh, down there at the gluteus maximus. You know, it works really well. Uh, but you shall not kill. He will not die. Uh, you shall strike him with the rod. And guess what it says? This is the best part. And rescue his soul. That neat? And what he's saying is, is that, you know, it's not that you're going to save him. He's going to be saved through Jesus Christ. But, you know, I always think about, you know, you see kids, you see their lifestyle, and you wonder what their parents ever taught them. He teach them anything. I mean, and, you know, uh, we were talking about this, but prison, you know, Father's Day, no letters, you know. Mother's Day, all kinds of uh, phone calls, I'm saying. And I think this is Dad's job to make sure this happens. You know, I, I think it, it you know, I, I, a couple times Mom hit me and I kind of chuckled every time. I never chuckled once when Dad hit me. You know, I mean, not once did I think it was funny when my dad spent uh, a couple times my mom was a little funny because she couldn't hit as hard as dad. And we got older, it was harder for her to do that. But boy, whew, whenever dad got busy, it was busy. Uh, and I, I'm not sure it worked totally all the way. I mean, our slot could have worked a little bit more, but it worked well. Okay. Uh, 2915, the rod of reproof gives wisdom. The child who gets his own way shames his mother. Um, think about that. Think about that. This is wise stuff here. Uh, vision 6, children obey your parents and the Lord for it is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. What was the promise? Live long, isn't it? That's what it says. In the Ten Commandments. Um, parents, do not provoke your children to anger. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Um, you are being certainly um, provoking your children if you don't teach them the ways of the Lord. Is that right? It's, it's facts. So that's another mitigation. Okay, that's the two mitigations of evil. One is conscience, one is family. Next week we're going to talk about uh, uh, we're going to talk about a word called nihilism. Okay, you're going to look it up. You can't. N I H I L I S M. Realism. And I'll tell you right now, it defines what's going on in our country right now. Okay? We'll talk about that next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study tonight. Pray you just help us to understand that you had plans for society and how it is to be peaceful. And Lord, forgive us when we don't do what you tell us to do and show us to do in your word. 
Lord, help us to be those who are strong in preaching and teaching the word. Christ in Christ we pray. Amen. Great having you tonight. Great being here.